I'm ready. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storyblox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome someone who has inspired me. Her story is going to challenge you. It's also going to be very uplifting at the same time. It's an incredible story, one of courage, of resilience, and a story I feel like everyone should get to know. My guest today is Tova Friedman. Now, thank you, the donor who she is. She's the youngest person to emerge from. One of the youngest. One of the youngest persons, yes. I should say. And there weren't many. Is that right, Tova? There weren't many at all to actually come from. Well, there are very few because children were the targets. Yeah. So every, whenever the uh, German army occupied a place, the first people, the first humans who were being uh, destroyed are the children. And yeah. then came the elderly. Yeah. So that they very very few children left from from that from the from from the terrible genocide. It's a harrowing story, but there's also hope and light. And Tova's here today, and she's sharing her story. She wrote a best-selling book, which is going absolutely crazy. She just told me that it hit the New York Times bestseller list, which I think it deserves. People need to read this book. It's called The Daughter of Auschwitz. They can get it wherever books are sold. It's coming. It's here in Australia as well as the US, Canada, UK, everywhere. So get a copy of it. Toba, now, it's, yep. it's number one in Canada. I it's just found that today. <laughs> it's, it's blowing up. And you can you can certainly tell why when you actually read the book. I'm up to chapter okay. three at the okay. moment. Toba, can I'm I welcome trying, you so much? I'd like to put us in the right you know, I'm playing with a computer, but I won't. Uh, yes. For years, you know, I wanted to, I've been doing a lot of talking. I, I, I speak on, uh, I, I don't know if you're about TikTok, but, but TikTok, but I am on it. But uh, I felt I really wanted to write it down because it's a completely different experience and I can go to a certain depth, which I cannot go when you just stand in the front of a group yeah. and you have like 40 minutes for your entire life. Yeah. So you you choose things, okay. Um, and then I went to a um, conference in 2020 in uh, Poland, which was the, <clears throat> excuse me, 20, uh, it was the 75th anniversary of Auschwitz liberation. Wow. There I met Malcolm, who was a correspondent. Oh, I'm sorry, my voice, I speak so much, by the way. Take your time. It's okay. We've got plenty of time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. He was he was a correspondent for the uh, uh, channel thirteen, the the nonprofit educational channel here. Yeah. And um, he 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 made a small uh, he made a very uh, a very small episode of me which appeared and it was excellent and a year later he called it he's we kept in touch he said you know what i think we should write a book together and i said how is that possible you are in, in england i am in america you're a man i'm a woman and it's going to be a child you're not jewish and you may not get the jewish experience and uh because of covid we can't meet each other we can't be in the same room he tried but you know he, he couldn't he couldn't leave uk so um he said let's try anyhow so we did and it was a challenge and it worked it worked and it's interesting when i wrote he slept when when he wrote i slept mm -hmm. so it somehow we but we somehow worked it out we did it on the computer back and forth and we only met a few times Zooming wow. and it worked, it, it, it worked. And you've now got this incredible book to show with has your story in it. Now, I wanted to ask you, you also talk about in the very beginning, the opening of the book, you talk about how this generation of young people are somewhat forgetting or... <laughs> They're, not forgetting, never knowing. They're never knowing as well. Never which, knowing. Which is because, because not all schools teach it. In New Jersey, 
Most schools teach it, but it's unusual state. Other states don't have the mandate. Mm-hmm. I am not sure what happens in other countries, like in Australia or Europe. I really don't know. And uh, I, I, I was sort of had this fear that I am the last generation. I'm 84, and I'm one of the youngest. Once I'm gone, we're gone. We're history. You can see us on, on, on YouTube. You can see us in a movie or something. But, you know, all that media can be doctored. You can do anything. You can, so people can say it didn't happen. Of course, she's telling you a story. She's talking about what? Yeah. So what? what uh, I was afraid that it'll just disappear. We will disappear with our history. And most of all, the people who are murdered, yeah. They will disappear from history. The million and a half children and six six million people just gassed, murdered. They will just disappear. And another reason is it's a warning. This book is is twofold. Mm-hmm. It's a memory. I'm doing it to remember and to warn, to let people know the dangers, what can happen if. I think, I think, I don't know who said it, if good people do nothing. Yeah. It falls and, and that's what happened. Because, you know, this whole thing of the Holocaust was a process. Like I always say, I didn't wake up one day in Auschwitz. It mm-hmm. was a process. And the process was years and years and years from the time when he, when, when he wrote My Kampf. When, when when Hitler wrote it. My father read it as a young man, and he just, just shrugged it, you know, oh, well, sick man, mental, mental, mental. Somebody's gonna take care of him. Yeah. So so it's a it's a warning also. So when Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, wasn't it, I believe you said 20 years later, that's right. when things started to unravel itself and no one really took warning or heeded those early warning signs. And even today, I don't think that the young generation, number one, they don't know about it. They need to know about it so that it stops them from repeating the same mistakes as what our predecessors did. But I'm I'm interested for you, Tova, having gone through this experience yourself, having lived through it, and now, now knowing and hearing that no one really knows about it and there is a warning there, but how does it make you feel that you could potentially be forgotten? Well, I'll tell you, there are, uh, we are all forgotten eventually, 100 years from now. However, right now, right this, I don't know how it's in Australia, but all over Europe and America, there are so, so much so many issues between people, yeah. between a politics, religion, color. Look at the shooting in our schools. Mm. I mean, America, it's, 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 it's upholding that, that somebody, that a kid may not come home because some mad person or whatever came in. And there is so much dissent right now, right now that I am I am very happy that I could I could in somehow say to somebody, stop, stop, stop for a minute, stop. Look what can happen to innocent children. Like right now what's happening yeah. with 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 the with the fighting right now. Kids are getting hurt. They're losing their families. They they, they don't have a normal life. Yeah. They're losing their homes. And look at all the refugees. This world has is scary. It's scary. And if people like myself who've been through this can say, stop and listen, I'll tell you a story, a yeah. real story. You're right. For myself growing up, I was blessed to hear these stories because it made me aware and it made me understand. Where did you, where did you hear them? I heard them number one in school, and then they second, do that really. Yeah, my my school in particular was very very good. I had a great history teacher that oh, okay. through all the stories, and 
from start to finish. And then myself, my my dad is a history nerd. So he he would what, all what is your dad again? The what? Sorry? What is your dad? He was a history nerd, so he oh, loved. Oh, oh, history! Yeah. That's great. So you he were was, you were blessed. He was always talking about um, World War Two things that went on, and then in my later years, I I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could. So I picked up books. I and when I started this show, even I reached out to another Holocaust survivor who wrote a brilliant book too. Um, and I wanted to to share this message because I think it is important so that your story lives on for a long time so that young people can understand that this atrocity happened in the past. Six million people died, including kids, and it's devastating. And I hope that that doesn't ever happen again. Well, that's the thing. Um uh- It's a warning in a sense that if you're not careful, it may not happen in that way because, you know, each generation has a different style. That doesn't mean that children will all be hurt. Yeah. In a different way. Or the elderly. In other words, uh, hatred and and, 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 uh, the, the fear of the other, the literal fear of the other, can lead to some kind of a catastrophe yeah. and that kids, and we all have to be aware and children, especially. From the eyes of going back a little bit to, to your story, from the eyes of a child, would you be able to help people understand what you, what you saw? And secondly, why do you think people hate in the first place? Why people hate in the first place? Yeah. Okay. I really believe that God or whoever created us gave us free will, yeah. but there is good and bad in us. Otherwise, there is no free will. You mm-hmm. can choose bad, you can choose good. All you need is a char- char- charismatic leader. What Hitler was very charismatic. Or, and if you look at other leaders, They're also like Mandela, a leader for good. They're leaders for good and leaders for evil. And if you're not careful, you will get hooked with a a leader for evil without knowing that he's evil because he promises you good life. And so what happens is uh, the side of us that there is always in all of us fear and hatred and for self-preservation. I mean, we're not born angels, at least. I don't see it as such. And so you have to be very careful who who you follow. And I think that young people have to be self-aware. It's a self, an inner, an inner awareness. What am I doing? And people hate, you know, Hitler promised that he, if he got rid of the Jews and other undesirables, and he would have an Aryan human being which is a a, a uh, Superman, yeah. a superhuman being with a special kind of blood, Aryan blood, whatever that is, uh, they will be much better off. The promise of being better off by ha- killing somebody else seems to be throughout history. You know, you go into a country and you take their spoils, you'll take their money, that you take their land, whatever. This is a a, a uh, common thing, but we have to be aware of it. Yeah. And I think a books like that and me, I, I say, stop, stop, wait, think about it. Will you be better off if you kill your neighbor? Yeah. What would be? You wouldn't have a neighbor. You may have a, a refrigerator, an extra refrigerator, but you won't have a neighbor. Yeah. So I, I think that's what that, that was one of the motivations that people like us are writing stories. Before we move into the hope side of things and what you're doing today and coming outside of of surviving Auschwitz, can I ask you to share? I'll take you a little bit back a bit to that time when it all started. It all began. Are you able to describe? You say in chapter three, like. 
the title is and then they came for you um are you able to to share what your upbringing was like before i think there's a story in there that you uh lived basically underneath the kitchen table i think it was right. and right. um you, you just had the the eyes of a child so if we can go back to to that time for a moment uh and you can share some of the some of the things that you saw uh, as a kid what your parents were like all those incredible things I want people to read the book. I don't want to give everything away, but I give them a little little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, You know, I never knew peace because I was born one year before the war. So my first awareness is in a ghetto already. Not even when we were in a lovely apartment with my grandparents. Already all the Jews from our town were put in a very small area, very, very crowded. And there was no space in general. There were no, I can't remember any other child there. There may may have been, but I remember a kid kid is little, right? Kids did come and visit under the table. I do remember that, but I'm not sure they lived with me. And um, I lived there because it was, it was, it was convenient in a sense. It was warm. It was safe. I had a lot of stuff under that blankets and every so often my mother you know, she fed me there, but I could hear what was going on and I could come out any time. It wasn't, an, it wasn't a punishment. It was just, it was just a place that I felt safe. And my mother, and I also knew at a very young age that the Germans were there to get us. This mm-hmm. I knew from the time I, I remember. Now, I don't know how I found out because, you know, it comes by osmosis, you hear it. And a child absorbs it without the words Very and I knew it's dangerous yeah you, you feel it you know like an animal you feel what is dangerous so I knew under I was safer and then one day they came in they got my grandmother and she 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 was elderly she lived a very short time with us because she lived mostly with her other children that are more religious my mother wasn't as religious but they they shot her right outside the house. And then I remember when my father came and he said to, then I was out, I was already out of the, under the table and I was standing by a regular table standing. And I remember my father, he he had tears, tears coming down. And he said, I put them on a wagon and we knew what that was. He escorted his parents. He helped them physically up and they were taken to where they were open graves. Mm. They had taken all the elderly. That was the day of the shooting of the elderly. So I heard that. I just wish I knew the date, but I didn't know dates or anything. But I remember there's such a, it was so vivid. My father was sitting on, 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 on my, here on my right side. My mother was on the left. It was the edge of the, of the table. Table came up to here to me and my parents never hid anything from me. Mm. Let me hear everything. And that's when I heard that they were, they're going to be gone. You're very aware as a child. How old were you when this was all taking place? About four. Four years old, being yeah. exposed to. Four and a half. I can remember the table. You know how tall I was and the table was there and my parents were sitting on both sides of the table. So when... So what actually transpired when your parents were taken? Did you go with them or? No, my parents weren't taken. It, I, I, you'll read the story. What, they, they liquidated the entire ghetto. They were moving us. They had taken 8,000 people and put them on a cattle cut to Treblinka. Yeah. And we knew that very few people came back. Just to give you an idea. The beginning of the war, there were 15,000 Jews, one five. It wasn't a gigantic town among Gentiles. These were the Jews population. At the end of the war, there were 300. So from 15,000, 300. From hundreds and hundreds of children, five. Five came back. So you can see how many people were, were, were murdered and those that came back. So, uh, one of the things they did, they would move us from place to place. I'm lucky I was only in three places. Other people were in 10 places. They move you in the middle of the night just to destroy 
any relationship you could have made because yeah. they were afraid of any rebellion or re you didn't even, in fact, you didn't even know where where, you, where the other people of the family were because there were no letters, no radio, no newspapers. If you got a newspaper or you they found a radio, you'd be shot because communication is so important. So they, my father used the word that each town he said were hermetically sealed. That's, that's his words, hermetically sealed. So uh, they they took, they decided they're going to close our ghetto, take all the Jews out. Most of them were, were taken to Treblinka to be killed. They left a few Jews. We were among them as a cleaning squad. Mm. See, they didn't want, it's hard to believe, but the motto was leave no witnesses because now children were witnesses. That's why they were also killed so quickly. Yeah. So here I am. I'm a witness. There are very few of us, but we are all witnesses. And he, um, so there were, there were like 36. The number isn't clear because some people say 36. Somebody told my father said it was 25. Then I read it was 36. About the, under 50. Yeah. And they were the ones who cleaned up the ghetto. So if anybody were to come, there was there would be no blood from the shootings. The graves were covered up. The, 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 uh, the, they went, we went inside the barracks. And I remember fixing the, my, with my mother. Of course, I, I, I didn't have to do this, yeah. but I was too scared, you know, to be alone in any place. So, so I would fix the pillows make the beds. So we left the the uh, the ghetto section completely clean uh, under duress. Yeah. And uh, then they took us to the next, they took all of us. We thought we we're going to be killed because we were not useful anymore. But they took us to the next camp, which was the labor camp. How, a, sorry, you can continue. No, no, go ahead. No, no problem. I was just going to ask you, how were you able to survive from being killed because you were a child and Never. the Nazis didn't Never. have little? I have no idea. I have no idea. I can tell you there were so many times that I should have been killed. Wow. And you just, I don't know. Sometimes, like, like um, we now went to the labor camp. And in the labor camp, the their job was only to work. My parents went very early in the morning and it, and and worked from 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 dawn to dusk and in in a factory, a munition factory. The factory was called Yellow Death, I think they called it, because they worked with a yellow type of some kind of a yellow uh, powder, which I don't know what it was. Some kind of a powder. I, I may have looked it up. Maybe it's in a book. I can't remember the name of it. And and, um, and the children were outside. And then there was a kid's selection. They went and got all the kids. But my parents hid me in a crawl space. So I made, again, this time. It was each time. You see, the plan wasn't a long-term plan. It was, can we live another day? Can we make it tomorrow? Yeah. Can I make it tonight? Can I not be shot in my bed while I was sleeping, which some people were? If I woke up in the morning and I'm alive, oh, I've got another day. So it wasn't a plan. Yeah. But my parents, and I heard it of other people too. They they had, it was a, there was already a crawl space. They didn't have to make it. It was there. Yeah. Many, many many Polish homes had like you know, for storage, and that's where I was hidden. I remember watching. I've watched the movie several times. Um, Schindler's List. Oh and yes, every yes. Every time I watch that movie, it makes me cry, and it's really really hard to watch. But one of the scenes, you see a child trying to find a hiding place. I don't know if it's in the ghetto or if it's in one of the the camps, and finds a in, in a latrine like the toilets and try all these other kids are in there already trying to hide did you see anything remotely similar to that in, in Auschwitz 
at all? I'm not, I'm not sure what you're telling me. Maybe, can you say it again? So in, they, they, they found what? In the movie, there's a scene yeah. where a kid is trying to look for a hiding place. And oh, hiding place. Yeah. Okay, I got, I got it. I got what you're saying. Yeah. Well, we weren't free enough. No, we couldn't do that. Uh, you see, they, they got, they tattooed us. You can't find a hiding place once you're tattooed. That was, that was the, the, the wisdom, I have to say wisdom, the cleverness of these people. Once they give you a number and they call it, and they, and they call the number every day, yeah. and you weren't there, they would shoot anybody until they found you. So you didn't dare. There was no place to hide. We were like open to, to, to whatever happens, completely open, like yeah. an open field. So, so, so you couldn't hide that I know of. Yeah. I'm sure the people who did, but I, I never even, even imagined it because I had to make sure and not, that when they, when they called my number, I said, here, here, I'm here, you know? How long were you in Auschwitz for? Well, I think we came around August. I'm not sure. So till, till January, uh, Till January for, uh, 27th, 1945. So, so August, September, October, November, December, about six months. Wow. Do you remember? Wow. Really? Wow. Six months. Can it's, you, it's amazing. It, and you survived six months, which is incredible that you did. Incredible. Even, even just dying from starvation. Yeah, as a little kid. So how, do, how were you able to... You know, I mean, can you describe from your perspective as going back as a kid, what were the conditions like for those people that? Well, know? with my mother or without. OK, I was taken away from my mother when I was very ill. Mm. They usually killed people who were ill. What they did was they put them in a room like a hospital, but without doctors that I know of. Yeah. And you survived, you survived if you didn't. And if you were weak, you were killed right away. It's a miracle that I survived. I had diphtheria and scarlet fever. My mother told me that after the war, I didn't know diseases and without any medication. Do you know that people die now without penicillin? Yeah. If you have diphtheria, yeah. scarlet fever is a dangerous... I, I just, six weeks later, my mother told me somehow I came out, but I didn't see my mother anymore. They took me away to the children's place. And that's where, what was like, first of all, you have to understand we were utterly starving. Yeah. Starving and cold. Because by then, uh, uh, Polish winters are very cold and they come very early by September, October, it is freezing. And we had very little clothes, so we didn't have that much energy. And we got very little food twice a day, a tiny bit of bread and some soup or something. And the kids just, just sat around. There was once in a while they took us for a walk. I remember that we were we lined up and we went out a little bit. And that's where we saw bodies all over. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a walk in a park. Right. It was on corpses that froze or that they didn't get a chance to, 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 to take them away. They were like strawed everywhere. Left them there. So, you know, that's, oh, and sometimes we would hear, we would meet other children outside. And I remember meeting children that were in the barrack of the twins, Mangula, and they would tell us the latest experiments. Kids would talk about everything. That's the funny thing about people think children don't know. I knew the experiments that Mangala was making that week because the other children told me. Wow. Do you share that in your book? I don't remember. No, that's okay. You know, it's, it's very hard to, uh, because we were so far away, I and, the, and my co-writer, we shared a lot, but as Memory is a strange thing. It comes out. I, I think you got a pretty, it's, you've got a pretty good idea there, but yeah. we know everything. Of course. And what you have shared already um, is really, really informative. The fact that you actually remember that much. Oh, is, my goodness. 
You, do you know? You know what kind of this I do share. You know, you know what kind of jokes we had. It wasn't really a joke, but that's how people behave. A, a, a five-year-old or four-year-old, I don't know how old, would take a little kid that's three, the younger one, and say to the kid, "I saw your parents," and the kid would say. How do you know? What do you mean you saw my parents? You don't even know what city I'm from. They're all Polish, but we didn't know what town people came from. You you never met me. Oh, yeah, come. And he would take them to the window and show them the, the smoke. Uh, See, your mother and father, I think your grandparents are right behind. And the kid would start screaming and crying. We all knew what was going on. Maybe we didn't psychologically feel it so much as if we were adults, but we knew quite a bit. Yeah. Going through a lot of that, I guess you could call it trauma um, and having to experience all that thing, all those things. Uh, I wanted to get to that part in just a moment, but I wanted to ask you about your mother. So your mother plays an important role in your life. Very uh, can you describe for me how important of a role your mother played? My mother saved me. She not only saved me physically, my mother saved me emotionally. Wow. Because physically she always knew how, how to hide me when necessary and so forth. But emotionally she verified what I saw. So I didn't feel crazy. You know how sometimes a child uh, hears that their parents are getting a divorce. Uh, He hears that at five years old, you can hear it. And the mother says, oh, no, no, we have a a fabulous marriage. Daddy and mommy will never leave each other and blah, blah. And then the child begins to wonder, what did he hear? Mm -hmm. Is he like, you know, well, with me, everything was... um, up in the front, everything that I heard and saw, my mother verified that it's true. Yes. For instance, when we got off the cattle car and I was facing those terrible dogs, the dogs have been, I still to this day, I I have trouble with German shepherds. Mm -hmm. Even the word German shepherd has a terrible you know, connotation. And I saw them very close to me because I was five, five and a half. They were like my height. And I said to her, they're going to kill me. I know they're going to eat me. They're going to kill me. She said, no, no, they won't because they train to kill only if you run. Mm -hmm. You're not going to run. I said, no. So therefore I knew I was safe because I knew I wasn't going to run. I was standing very still, very, very stiff and very still. She, she, she helped me interpret reality yeah. so that I don't think that I am nuts, that I'm hearing things that are wrong, that I'm wrong. Yeah. And that, I think, uh, gave me a lot of, I think, a lot of self-confidence also. Yeah. Because I heard, I saw, and what I heard and saw was true. Yeah. In, in real, it was based in reality, not not just in my head. No, she survived, right? Oh, she survived, but she died very young. Oh, how long after the Holocaust did she? Did she seven die? years. Seven years. She, I think it was seven. She died. <clears throat> she died in fifty-seven. Oh, maybe a bit, maybe longer than we. Oh, I I know. Seven years since we came to America. Yeah. As as soon as we arrived to America and I was sort of safe and went to school and she made me as normal a life as possible, she died. Wow. And what was that experience like for you Uh, with your mother? That was was the worst. Yeah. Because I wasn't even home. I had taken my first trip to Israel and she said to me, I don't want you to go. I may never see you again. I said, it's only a two week trip. What do you mean I'm not going to see you again? And she died two, two days after I left. Was she sick? No, not sick. She went to sleep and she died. She didn't wake up. 
So she died peacefully at least. I hope so. Yeah. I, How old were you when that happened? 18. 18 years old. So your mother's passed away. Did your father make it as well? Oh, my father, yeah, remarried shortly after that, about a year later. Yeah. And he married a wonderful woman, which was very lucky. Fabulous woman. Yeah. And she continued my healing in a sense. She was she was also a Holocaust survivor, but from Russia. She had a different experience. She was very kind to me. Yeah. And she had no children. So I became her child. So talking about the healing process for you, it would it would I can only imagine there would be a lifelong healing process for you. Um, what are some of the things that you've learned about healing from this kind of traumatic experience? First of all, <clears throat> it's very important to talk about it. Yeah. As a therapist, you know, I know uh, how important it is to share your pain, otherwise it festers. Yeah. And if it sees the light of day, you could control it better. You could understand it better. It's not like I was not the only victim. Yeah. I, it, it, there were other people and how lucky I am that I'm here and others aren't. So I, be, it, I, I started talking about it, but not till I was a mother already. In the beginning, I couldn't talk. Yeah. And then I shared it with, with a lot of other people. And, and when they became interested, in the beginning, nobody was interested. In the 50s or 60s, nobody. About 70s and 80s, maybe even later, 80s and 90s, people began to, 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 to allow us to talk. Yeah. So then it was great, number one. Number two, when I came to America, I met a lot of other child survivors. They weren't from Auschwitz, they were from Russia. Yeah. But still survivors in some way. So again, I had a group that got me, understood me, that I, I, I couldn't get into the American culture. I didn't understand the American kids. Yeah. But I could understand the European kids. We all spoke Yiddish. We all had accents. We all had parents who were half the time hysterical. If we were late a half hour, you know, something. We understood each other. And that's very good in healing. And for you to actually have the permission, I guess, to to share your story, I wanted to wanted to ask you the moment that you did share it. Can you take me back of what led you to sharing it? Why did you want to share it? Well, the first sharing, very first one was my daughter was in high school, but in at, uh, maybe a little bit younger. And the teacher said something about, uh, oh, she came home. She said, oh, they're talking about Holocaust. And I, my kids know about me from the time they, from the time they asked what yeah. the number was. Mm -hmm. um, will you talk? So I talked to a little class. And then my temple, it was mostly in a Jewish groups, a little bit, once or twice a year. And then somebody said, oh, can you talk to my class, the, a regular public school? And it spread. Yeah. And I say yes to everything. I'm a yes person. I'll talk, I'll come, I'll go. <laughs> so how many, how many children did you have? I have four. Four and children? Eight and eight grandchildren, yeah. Eight grandchildren. You have, um, I believe, in this book, in this version that I have, you have a couple of photos in here. And I wanted to show everyone. Oh, yeah, my kids. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And my husband. And, your and, then, husband. And, then, and then the bar mitzvah, that's very nice. I'm glad they're there. Um, I was uh, looking through all my love visual the way my brain works as well. And there's also U80 University teaching in Michigan in 2015, I believe. Right. There's a right. great one with you in New Jersey showing your number to to the kids. Um, right, right. And yeah. having having all these experiences. But I wanted to ask you a, a very important question regarding the topic of forgiveness. Now, 
I know it's a very touchy subject for some survivors to talk about, but what do you, what's your experience been like with this topic? In Judaism, only the person who can forgive is the person who was hurt. Yeah. Those people are dead. They're ashes. They can't forgive. I will not forgive for them. Yeah. I, I, I cannot forgive for them. Forgiveness No. Okay. Now, uh, I have a, the new generation, I know is different. And I know Germany is different. And I have, if I ever go to Germany, because the book is translated into German, how I'll be able to separate this generation to everything, to their, to their grandparents and great grandparents, but they did. Yeah. I, I don't know. I hope I'll be able to. Yeah. What's your, your number one hope for this book? Hope? Yeah. That as many people in the children, young people, especially like in, young, I mean, like in the twenties, Yeah. you know, 20, 30, where they should have known and they don't. And yet they mature enough to understand it. And and um, that, that as many people as possible read it. I'm 26. And, You're 26? I'm 26. And I consider this a huge honor to be able to speak with you and, and listen to your story. And I can't wait to finish your book. I apologize that I haven't because I'm actually releasing my my own book. <laughs> oh, wow. Let, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. The path of an wow eagle. Wow. Yeah. So that's um. This is my. What, what, kind of, what is it about? So it, it's pretty much about. I can't really compare my story with your story, but you don't have I've, to compare. I've I've been through some crazy challenges over the course of my life. Some different obstacles that I've had to learn how to overcome. And I think as a young person, uh, for a lot of people like even older people, they look at a young person, they think, oh, he hasn't been through much. And well, it's a mistake. Big, yeah. big, big time mistake. So I know that people are out there that are suffering at the moment. So I wanted to give them a unique healing path forward. Um, and so that's really the path of an eagle. When okay. not, you get back one, up. And give me one sentence. One or, sentence. Or two um, sentences. What is the number one healing for you? Number one healing for me, that's a good question. Uh, for me, it was knowing that my story matters and I can share my story to other people. I think you mentioned the importance of talking about your story and not keeping it deep down inside because there are people out there that are suffering in silence. And I think we need to bring that pain to light. I always say that we should exactly. Make- we should make our mental health loud rather than silent. That's my my whole experience. You're right. You know, uh, five of us survived. Four, really. One, five survived, but one is in in, in Germany. I only met her once. But uh, one of the people that I was very friend, very close to, uh, survived survived with me. I, 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 our parents were friends, so we knew each other way. I never wanted to talk about it. And she committed suicide. Oh, no. It never, she was not able to share it. She just couldn't. I've heard stories like that of people that, that couldn't, and they've just, they've taken their own life because they couldn't cope with any more of the pain. Exactly. exactly. And it's terrible. I wanted to... Rounding up this conversation, Tova, because I know you've been very, very gracious with your time. You cleared your calendar for me, which I thought Absolutely. was incredible. Um, you're an amazing human being. And this question I wanted to ask you. Is your what, book in America? Can I get it on, on, on Amazon? I will send you a copy. I will oh. I will personally sign a copy and send it to you. So I'll ask after this, I'll ask for your address if you don't mind, and I will send you a copy of the book. I so love that, it. So you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> so uh, I wish I could send my, you know, electronically. We do it, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We 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 can um 
but I'll, I'll make sure that you actually get a proper signed copy um, from me. If that means anything, <laughs> my signature. I'd much rather have your signature, but I'm going to have to meet you in person one of these days I want to get over to the States. But um, don't, don't, don't wait too long. I don't even buy green bananas. You don't? <laughs> that's good. <laughs> oh, that's great. I won't wait too long. That is my promise. Hopefully I can get over there by next year. Um, good. And I, I will. You're in New York, right? Uh, New Jersey, same New, thing. New Jersey. For you, it's the same thing. You're so far away. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure that we uh, we connect during that time for maybe a part two conversation. But okay. um, I wanted to ask you, Tova, this is my second last question for you. What do you love the most about yourself and your story? Myself. I don't think of loving myself. I don't have that kind of an attitude towards me. <laughs> I, 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 what it is, is I am humbled and surprised that this book, which I thought will just be wonderful, so my grandkids will know the story, is all of a sudden, uh, it's so widespread and everybody's grandchildren may know the story. It's just amazing. Um, I'm happy about the book because it encompassed, although not in depth, because we only had six, seven months to write the whole thing. Wow. And we, I would have had, I would have liked a year or two. This is why new things come up that I forgot to tell Malcolm because when I remembered that he was sleeping, Mm. And I wrote it down somewhere that I couldn't find where I wrote it. You know, it's different when you sit next to each other. Yeah. So uh, I'm only happy that it, it it encompasses from the beginning almost to to now. Not in depth, but it gives a a a a, a bird's view idea of a life that is still going on. Yeah. It's not like written after my death. No. And there are no accolades. Oh, she was so wonderful and she was this. None of it. I wrote myself. I wasn't so great. Mm. I told the truth as much as I could. I wasn't the best mother. I didn't know how to play. Yeah. I, I didn't go shopping. I didn't go to a mall because it's not my mind, mm. you know? So so what my husband did, though, so it, it we balanced it. Mm. So what I'm saying is I'm just happy that the book – is so successful and I am pleased that I didn't give up in writing it, that I and Malcolm persisted. And I said, are you sure we could do it? Oh, there was some, we have deadlines. How will I, I have to, I'm working too, by the way, I have a job. I said, oh, between work and my grandchildren. And, oh, he said, we'll do it. And, and my son, Shani was here every day saying to me, we'll do it, we'll do it. You do it, sit down. We're doing it. And that was fabulous. I'm grateful for my support of my family and that Malcolm persisted and of the wonderful reception. Mm. But I've been happy that I was um, disciplined to do it. That's what, I, oh, that's what I'm happy about, that I was disciplined yeah. because there were so many distractions. I think you've got one of the most incredible stories ever. And Thank I'm you. grateful that you actually wrote it down because people will pick up this book and they will remember your story because it is written down. And I think timeless wisdom comes from books. Uh, I'm an avid reader. So thank you, Tova, for your story, for surviving as well. And, and I'll be happy to read your story. Thank you. I'll make sure that you get it. Um, and I really do appreciate it. My final question for you, people can go and get a copy of your book. It's called The Daughter of Auschwitz. It's available on Amazon, anywhere books are sold in America, Australia. You can see it actually in, in local bookstores too, which I think is pretty cool. I love going into bookstores and seeing people that I know on their books on display. Just gives do me you have a, Do you have a store called Costco? Or you don't have that? We do, we do actually. Oh, it's, it's in Costco. 
It's down in Sydney. So we've got, I think, two yeah. in Sydney. So I, don't know. I believe that your book should be in Costco. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it's in here. It's in New Jersey Costco. I don't know if it's in, in, in Sydney Costco. I will check for you because I'm going down to Sydney uh, very soon. So I will take a photo for you and then I'll send it your way to let you know that it's actually in Costco in Australia. Um, this is my my final question for you, Tova. It's my all-time favorite question. I love asking all my guests at the end. It is a hypothetical one, but I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. You're not too far away from that number at the moment. And I, and I was what? You've Doing been what? able to reach the age of 100. That I reach the age of 100. Oh, right. Right. from your mouth to God's ears. I like that. <laughs> I have no doubt that you will reach that age and beyond, and I hope that you do. Uh, but imagine that that has happened. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? I'll say it very simply. She didn't waste her time on this earth. She used the years that she was given as productively as possible. Uh, she was grateful for the years that she was given and she used every one as if it were a treasure. And every year was something special that she did or accomplished and that she hopes that she leaves this world better than she found it. Over you're a gem. You're an honest to God gem of a human being. I'm so glad that we have met and I got to listen to your story. Thank you so much for sharing and for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Thank you very much.